in any case. All right, hello, good morning, okay. good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the event uh, by Fairpool CEO presenting narrative analysis. Before we get started, one quick announcement. I'll give the attendance form at the halfway mark in the YouTube chat. Don't forget to claim your 10X metrics for attending this workshop. And as you probably are well aware by now, X metrics is metric styles, non-monetary and non-transferable token that proves on chain your early participation in metric style. Uh, today's event is by Dennis Gorbachev, as I mentioned before. He is here to discuss narrative analysis and how it can be used to gauge the current landscape of social tokens. And that is going to tie, then transition to his analysis of the current implementations of social tokens and their pros and cons. And how Fairpool intends to address some of the shortcomings of the current implementations. Without further delay, let's uh, welcome Dennis. And Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you. So let's start. Uh, the narrative analysis is a new way to think about the markets. It's a super set of fundamental analysis and the technical analysis. So if you're a trader or if you're an investor, you can use the narrative analysis to improve your hit rate, improve your win rate. Um, here is how it works. Um, instead of thinking about the uh, the fundamentals or instead of thinking about the technicals, uh, the technical factors uh, and trying to determine whether these fundamental factors are uh, actually going to influence the price or not. Instead of that, instead of thinking about the truth of those fundamental or technical factors, you are trying to think about uh, whether those uh, fundamental or technical factors are going to be viral enough. So again, instead of thinking about the truth or falsity of some assertion, you are trying to think about whether this assertion is going to spread in the population. Uh, it's like you can imagine it like this. Every fundamental, every piece of fundamental analysis, every article, every, uh, every tweet is uh, an idea, basically. And uh, it could be right, it could be wrong, but it doesn't matter. What actually matters is whether this idea is viral enough whether this idea spreads in the population of traders and investors. And the same with the technical analysis. analysis. So uh, if someone believes that if the price goes above a certain price level, then it's going to go up even further, and they are watching the chart, then it doesn't matter whether the chart is, whether, what, what you think about this. What matters is that a sufficient amount of people are watching the same price level, and if the price approaches or hits this price level, uh, then those people actually buy because it's uh, what they believe in. It's their belief set, you know? So uh, what you're trying to determine with narrative analysis is uh, whether a specific belief is going, to be, uh, is going to be viral, is going to be applied by the people. And uh, this is very much different from the regular fundamental and technical analysis uh, where you're trying to actually apply those rules. Instead of applying those rules, you take a look at what other people are thinking about those rules. I hope this idea is clear. So um, a good question is, how do you actually determine the virality, the uh, livelihood of the idea? Well, there are multiple ways. Uh, the most straightforward, the most simple to apply and simple to understand way is to actually be the person, actually... Um, yeah, be, be the person who is a representative of the population and just ask yourself whether the idea uh, seems exciting to you. This, uh, what I tell you, is um, easy to uh, apply in theory, but not so easy to apply in practice because uh, you do want to ensure that you are the actual member of your population. So, for example, uh, if you're a trader or an investor, uh, if you're just a beginner trader, of you, or if you had just started uh, as an investor, that means you are not very representative of the big money. You just don't know uh, how the big fund managers think. Uh, it takes some time in order to understand their mindset and uh, to adopt this mindset. In, but, but if you do, then you can use 
your own judgment. And uh, if the idea excites you, then most likely this idea is going to be uh, just as exciting for them as well. Uh, another way to determine the virality of the idea is to suspend your own judgment completely and uh, listen to the reactions of other people. And just to give you an example, let's say you're sitting in a room or at a meetup uh, with programmers, with people who are very experienced in a specific area and which do you possess a domain specific knowledge. Uh, and let's assume that you do not possess this domain specific knowledge. Let's assume that you're not pro a programmer, not a developer. So you're sitting in a meetup and those developers are speaking about some things like they're throwing out terms which you don't understand and they, they are talking about ideas that you don't understand even fully. Uh, so uh, let's say one developer stands up and presents an idea and the other developers are like, mm, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Okay, thank you very much. And that's it. So this uh, these kind of reaction is not the reaction that you're looking for. <laughs> there is no real emotional reaction here. Uh, people are just paying, say, um, they, they're just encouraging the person. Uh, they're saying, that, yeah, that was, that was an okay presentation. Thank you. That's it. But if you hear that, the friends, the peers of a developer are actually very excited about the idea. And uh, you can judge their excitement by the fact that they're asking a lot of questions after the presentation and uh, they are thinking about um, different ways to apply this new technology that was presented by uh, a specific developer. Uh, then you can see uh, that this idea that has been discussed has been, has been told by a specific developer. Uh, is actually becoming viral. Um, actually, you cannot determine the virality just yet. You can determine whether it's exciting enough for people. And the uh, determination of virality is the next step. So after the meetup, uh, you can continue speaking with those people who have been attending the meetup, uh, the other developers, and you can ask them casually, like, hey, uh, did you mention the facts of uh, any presentation on this event to any of your friends? But you can check this virality. And if someone says, yeah, I mentioned uh, the details of this specific presentation to my friends, I told my friends about this specific presentation, then you can uh, be sure that the, this spread of the idea in the population is actually happening. You can check it. And uh, just by this by this check, you can determine whether the idea is viral or not without even understanding the idea. And that's the beauty of the narrative analysis, because you can uh, you can determine the virality of the idea without even understanding the technical details, without even understanding the implementation, and without thinking whether this idea is right or wrong or correct or whatever. What actually matters is the livelihood, like whether the idea spreads in the population. So uh, this, uh, these are a couple of ways that you can use the narrative analysis to determine uh, whether you should buy or sell a specific asset based on the ideas which are connected with this asset. Uh, and uh, I can also give you a couple of examples from the recent bull run uh, of uh, uh, for example, Dogecoin, everybody knows what happened. So Elon Musk started tweeting about Dogecoin and suddenly it started to go up. And, you know, it doesn't make sense. If uh, if a person just tweets about a token, uh, from the fundamental perspective, it doesn't make any sense, right? And uh, from the technical perspective, okay, yeah, maybe it starts breaking some technical levels, but you want to buy earlier, right? Uh, and the real reason for the rise is not the break of a technical level break of a technical level is just a consequence of Elon Musk tweeting about Dogecoin. So uh, if you think about this, uh, there is no fundamental value. There, and Dogecoin it, by itself, it didn't change, right, from the tweet of Elon Musk. But the tweet itself was viral enough. And the series of tweets were viral enough. So uh, just because of that, you can determine that, uh, okay, that idea about buying Dogecoin just because Elon Musk tweets about it is viral enough. So you can use it as an entry point. 
And that's great. You don't need to think about whether it's correct or not. Uh, another um, example is the uh, the reason for the uh, entire crypto bull run is that, uh, well, people were thinking that Federal Reserve is going to uh, print a lot of US dollars in future. So you should buy crypto now uh, in, in order to hedge yourself against inflation. And this narrative was much deeper on a fundamental level. And it was correct on a fundamental level. You could check it. You could go to the Federal Reserve website and you could check that, yeah, these guys are actually printing US dollars. <laughs> that's gonna be like, that's crazy. <laughs> so you do want to buy crypto or any asset in these conditions. You, you, you want to be out of USD completely uh, when, when the inflation hits. Uh, so this narrative was correct. And uh, the correctness of the narrative actually was one of the reasons that the narrative was spreading in the population so, uh, uh, so widely and in multiple different populations. So uh, this population hit the, uh, the regular people, the uh, people who don't normally listen to the financial news. So uh, this, was, this is an example of a, narr of a narrative which spreads in the population on multiple levels. Uh, but what really mattered is not the fact whether it was correct or not, whether it was possible to check it or not. The, what really mattered was the, uh, was the extent of its spread and the speed of its spread. And also the, uh, the depth of implications. Because let's say if Elon Musk tweets about Dogecoin, uh, well, today he can tweet a good thing, tomorrow he can tweet a bad thing, tomorrow he can switch to another coin, you, you never know. Uh, but the printing of US dollars is a much uh, deeper narrative because... Uh, if you can check it, uh, and if, if it's a long-term policy, then uh, you are able to determine, you're, you're able to conclude that this narrative will not be aborted suddenly, okay? So uh, it's much easier to trend, uh, sorry, to trade based on those uh, deeper narratives, based on those more, much more fundamental narratives. So here we go, a couple of examples of narratives. Uh, and I wanted to emphasize that you didn't need to determine whether it was correct or not. You only needed to determine whether it was spreading wide enough in the population. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send a message to, uh, you can find the chat below, uh, below the YouTube video. And uh, yeah, just let me know if you have any questions, if you need more examples. Okay, uh, right now I don't see any questions, but any questions appear, you'll be able, will be able to answer it. Now, you might be wondering what are the important narratives which are going on in crypto right now? Well, uh, there was a most important fundamental narrative and that's the Fed pilot. Uh, in general, crypto people started paying a lot of attention to uh, the speeches of Jerome Powell and to the announcements of Federal Reserve because well, actually, uh, this is what most people in the markets are paying attention right now. So even the uh, traditional finance, the mostly the traditional finance traders, they have been paying attention to these speeches uh, much earlier than crypto people. But right now, it's all integrated. Right now, it's all intertwined. So uh, crypto people started paying attention to that as well, to the CPI reports, to the jobs reports, all those things, <laughs> the traditional things. <laughs> So uh, the reason for that is that uh, actually some of the fundamental narratives of the traditional finance, they are driving crypto as well. Because if the amount of US dollar in the economy decreases, then of course it's going to affect the crypto markets as well. The liquidity on the crypto market is going to dry up as well. And that was the narrative behind the uh, recent dump in crypto. Uh, but the new emerging narrative is that uh, the inflation is actually uh, going down, and uh, you can see it by the numbers, by the statistics which are being released uh, by the government, by the Federal Reserve as well. So there are expectations of the Federal Reserve piloting, which means uh, backing down on their tightening policy. And uh, it doesn't matter whether this narrative is correct or not. Actually, this narrative is just a speculation. You never know whether the Federal Reserve 
is going to uh, continue tapering or is going to stop tapering, uh, you just don't know. <laughs> so uh, what you do know is that this narrative is becoming viral because uh, people are hopeful. People want to believe it. And uh, that's why people are spreading it. It's like good news, you know. Uh, hey, man, Federal Reserve is going to taper, most likely, most likely, uh, sorry, uh, to, to stop tapering. Federal Reserve is going to uh, become more uh, accommodative in their policies. So the amount of US dollar in the economy is going to increase anyway. <laughs> so uh, the, this narrative is, being, is uh, spreading in the population right now, at least that's what, what I hear. Uh, yeah, you also have multiple other sub narratives. For example, um, uh, recently there was a uh, narrative about Ethereum, Ethereum becoming a staking asset and becoming a deflationary asset. Uh, and you have already seen the uh, price trend in Ethereum. Uh, after that, we had the FTX collapse, which is bad enough. But anyway, uh, I think, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Harvesto. Orlando, sorry, I don't understand. Don't know what what's you know, the part of the name. <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah, another thing, uh, another uh, the, the the major narrative right now is the uh, uh, the pilot in the Federal Reserve. Uh, so most people are hoping are betting on that, and you already see that people are already buying because of their expectation. So. Uh, even before the announcement, the, the Federal Reserve didn't announce yet that they are going to uh, print even more US dollars. But it doesn't matter. What actually matters is that people believe that this is going to happen in future. And this is a current belief. So right now you have a belief spreading that they are going to do it in future. So people are taking action right now because of this belief about the future. Um, it's also a good lesson. Like You shouldn't be waiting until the event actually happens, you should act on the rumor if the rumor is spreading uh, wide enough. So that's what happened. That's what's happening right now. Um, what else? Uh, you also have multiple different uh, like sub-narratives because uh, if the Federal Reserve is actually going to uh, continue printing US dollars in this or another way, and they, they have multiple ways to continue doing that, uh, yeah, actually, that's important. So I want to emphasize that. That even if the Federal Reserve uh, that doesn't say that uh, we are going to uh, try to target the uh, uh, inflation rate, uh, we're going to try to lower the inflation rate, they will continue saying that they will continue fighting inflation. But they do have multiple other ways to continue injecting liquidity. For example, they can say, oh, we're going to provide some support for the businesses which have been hit by our inflation reduction program. Uh, and by this support, we are going to lend them money at a special rate. Well, that's, that's still lending money. <laughs> that's still increasing the amount of money in the economy. So uh, what they can do is like, uh, uh, with one hand, they could be taken away and with the other hand, they could be giving. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, even right now, uh, if the primary narrative, at least right now, still is that uh, the Federal Reserve is tapering, the Federal Reserve is fighting the inflation, uh, they could be uh, actually they could be giving away more than they they, they are taking away. Uh, but this uh, requires taking a look at the reports. This requires reading all these documents about multiple various multiple different programs that are being run by the Federal Reserve. And ain't nobody get no time for that. <laughs> so all those, uh, those people who actually read those reports, these become uh, the creators of new narratives. Uh, they simple them, they, they simplify them, they break them down, and they simplify them into basic like, uh, basics like whether the Federal Reserve is basically printing or it's basically not printing. Um, that's also another uh, criteria of a good narrative, whether it's simple. It has to be simple. If you have two narratives and one narrative is very complicated and another narrative is super simple, 
it doesn't matter if uh, maybe you're super smart and you are thinking that, oh, this super complicated narrative is actually more correct than this super simple narrative. It doesn't matter <laughs> because most people can only understand super simple narratives. So the super simple narrative will win over the complicated narrative. Uh, what else? Uh, yeah, we can go into other narratives in crypto that we have. Well, one of the narratives that we have right now is the social tokens. I've been thinking about what are the upcoming narratives, and I think the social tokens narrative is the uh, the big upcoming narrative in crypto. Uh, we already have that with projects like Socios. They are issuing the tokens uh, for the football clubs. Uh, what we have here is a token which, on one hand, is linked to a well-known brand, uh, to a well-known football club, but on the other hand, it doesn't have a lot of uh, fundamental value. Like uh, uh, with some tokens, uh, well, you can use them to get exclusive uh, exclusive interviews from the uh, with the football club members. You can get some some perks from that. Yes, there is some fundamental narrative, but it's not it's not big enough. You know, it's not like a it's not like a share of a, a real company which pays you dividends. No, it doesn't give any any dividends. So uh, you have tokens which are linked with brands which do not necessarily pay dividends, which do not necessarily even produce a, make make a product. So the football club doesn't have a product. The football club. Uh, plays, uh, competes in the football leagues and uh, the football club uh, brand becomes well-known only because of their wins or losses, not because of the products that they produce, that they make. So in a sense, it's very different from a regular startup in which you buy shares. And it's very different from a, a regular crypto project in which the token should theoretically be linked to the cash flows of that company. Uh, it's sits somewhere in between. Uh, let's say we have Uniswap and the Uniswap has a governance token. And this token is not yet directly linked to the cash flows of the company, of the Uniswap, the company itself. So uh, the brand token, the social token, is a step forward in this direction. Because we have already seen that uh, you don't really need the uh, token to be linked to some fundamentals in order to go up or down in price. So that means it's possible for the football token to go up or down in price uh, just because some people believe that this token is going to go up. For example, uh, if a football club actually wins the, uh, the tournament or actually wins a certain match, it's possible for this football token to actually go up. And uh, the people are betting on this. So it's possible for the people to buy the token before the event, before the match, uh, as a way to bet on uh, the outcome of the match. So that's what's happening right now. And uh, these social tokens are already on Binance. Some of those tokens are, are, li are already listed on Binance. And if we take a look at the volume, let me share this tab with you. So, okay, that's CoinMarketCap. CoinMarketCap has this view for the social tokens, uh, called them fan tokens. Uh, you can see that uh, Latia, for example, it has a pretty healthy volume. That's sixteen million dollars of twenty-four hours volume. That means that's daily volume. And even though the market cap is not huge, okay, it's understandable because uh, the value proposition is token it's, uh, of the token itself, at least in my opinion, is not very uh, attractive for the uh, investors because, for example, it doesn't provide any dividends. Uh, compared to Ethereum, for example, if you have US dollars, you can invest, uh, you can either buy Ethereum or you can buy Latio. And uh, well, Ethereum gives you 4%, around 4% uh, dividends yearly just from staking Ethereum. So this one doesn't have it, Latio token. Uh, you can see that in general, those tokens are quite popular. The uh, market caps and the volume uh, is pretty healthy. You can sort by the uh, volume, you can see that, okay, this one has $25 million, it's even more. This token is actually listed on Binance. So you can see that people uh, do trade these social tokens, do trade those fan tokens. Uh, the volume is pretty healthy, the market caps are low, but pretty healthy as well. So I think uh, 
these tokens are just the first wave of the social tokens. And uh, these tokens, they create the, uh, uh, the credibility, they bring the credibility to the entire um, space of the social tokens. And I think in future, we'll see a lot of the brands issuing their tokens. So even if the token is not directly linked to the cash flows of the company, even if the token is not a uh, share in the, uh, um, in the financial sense of this word, uh, it's still possible for the token to go up and down. So for example, let's say if Tesla, the company, issues a Tesla token and says, hey guys, this Tesla token is not a share of the company. It doesn't give you any voting rights, doesn't give you any dividends. It's just a token which is associated with our company. And by the way, we have a link to the, this token page in our Twitter. What's going to happen? Everybody's going to start buying this token. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, that's another way to, for people who don't have access to Tesla, the share, I mean, for people who are residents of the restricted countries, for example, or people who just don't have a, a U.S. bank account, that don't have a U.S. exchange account, um, people from India, people from, uh, even from Europe, some, for, for some people, it's quite hard to register on the exchanges. And uh, they don't want to just go through the hassle and they don't want to, maybe they don't want to uh, pay taxes or maybe they want to uh, have this uh, option of self-custody because normally if you're a European uh, person, you, you can't physically acquire Tesla shares. You have to uh, keep those shares at a, uh, at a person, at a custodian, at a person uh, or a, sorry, a company actually, which holds the shares for you. So if you want to do self-custody, you can only do, that with, do this with crypto assets. And uh, if Tesla as a company issues a Tesla token, then you can buy this Tesla token and you, you can self-custody this Tesla token. Uh, so that's a better value proposition for you specifically. So uh, this way I want to, sh I want to show that uh, the uh, token, uh, which, has been, uh, which is not being linked to the cash flows of the company, is pretty good is a pretty good financial instrument also and uh, some people would want to buy that as well so here we go you have uh, i think we have an upcoming wave of the brand tokens and i think those football tokens are just the initial wave just just the uh, the canary in the coal mine you could say <laughs> so uh we have a question um okay uh, what other benefits do holders uh, of football tokens derive besides the value? Okay, uh, so yeah, they get the uh, access, get access to the uh, uh, exclusive content from the team. So uh, there are different designs of these football tokens. Uh, most likely, like most, most often, if you hold a specific amount of those tokens, then you get access to this uh, to this exclusive content. Uh, I think you also get access to an exclusive chat, but of course there is no guarantee that a specific um, specific member of the team replies to your specific message. So you can send a message and uh, you can expect that it's going to be answered, but there's no guarantee and it's going to be answered. Um, so yeah, basically uh, uh, there are some, uh, if you're a fan of this team, then you might want to buy this token in order to get uh, these fan benefits. That's, that's the value proposition of those uh, football tokens. Uh, another question. Uh, what prompted the uh, narrative analysis token evaluation model? Um, I assume that by what prompted you mean, like, uh, why did we decide to, uh, to, to create it? Why did we decide to uh, start thinking about it this way? Well, um, that was uh, from the uh, personal need of, the, uh, of, of finding the right way to uh, evaluate the ideas. I've realized that sometimes uh, when, when I've been initially, I've been evaluating the ideas based on my uh, subjective uh, opinion about the truth or falsity of, the, of a specific idea. Uh, and I've noticed that a couple of times the idea was dismissed by me as, a, as an incorrect or as a, something like uh, it's going to pass, like a fad. 
Uh, but actually, the idea caught on, and the idea became viral, and uh, the the price of a specific token, which was linked to this idea, actually started to increase. See, I was thinking, damn, I missed this. <laughs> and I was thinking, okay, so what actually made the token go up? And I realized that uh, it doesn't didn't matter whether this idea was correct or not. What, what actually mattered was the just the virality of the idea. And that's why I decided to upgrade my analysis. I decided to stop paying attention to the uh, actual correctness of the idea uh, and to start paying attention to whether this idea spreads in the population. Um, what actually helped me was, well, actually, I, I still use the fundamental analysis uh, in general by itself uh, just to uh, validate the narrative. So for me, uh, if the reason agreement, if let's say uh, I take a look at the, at, at the narrative and I also agree with the underlying fundamental narrative, uh, then it's uh, it's an additional point, let's say, uh, in a scoring card. So uh, you can use the cell, you can use it the uh, same way. So instead of saying like, uh, oh, I only take uh, take a look at this, uh, I, I only try to hear, determine whether this idea is viral or not. Okay, you can also uh, take a look at the uh, fundamental analysis, from the fundamental narrative behind this, uh, behind below, below the uh, under the narrative. But uh, still, the most important thing is whether it spreads or not. Even if it's fundamentally correct, even if you believe in it so much, it doesn't matter what you believe in. What what really matters is what the population, what most of the traders believe in. So yeah. Uh, what prompted this narrative analysis is the uh, personal desire to uh, to be a better investor. So, I hope that answers the question. Um, okay, there is another question. That that question is about the Google form. Mm -hmm. uh, another question is whether the existing tooling, existing platforms like Patreon, YouTube. Uh, payments can make social tokens unnecessary. Um, I think uh, the reason overlap here in the sense that Patreon, for example, provides uh, the ability for the fans to subscribe uh, to a specific influencer, which which they like, and uh, to receive the benefits. Uh, yes, the reason overlap, and uh, it depends on how you see it. If, uh, if the influencer or if, if a brand wants to hear uh, make money on the uh, trading volume, or if they want to reach a wider population, uh, then they might want to issue a token. Because the token by itself has an additional value proposition. The token can be bought or sold. And if you compare it just with a regular Patreon, in a regular Patreon, you just spend your money, you get the content, and that's it. You cannot resell the content by the uh, agreement. And, uh, well, you, you cannot... Uh, basically, you cannot do anything with the uh, purchase. Well, you purchase the content and that's it. But with a token, if you purchase the token, you can resell it in the future. So you have the option, like whether you want to uh, use this token to purchase content or whether you just want to speculate on this token and whether you want just want to buy it right now in hopes of selling it in future. And uh, I think uh, that it, this adds a lot of... Um, of the uh, of the value proposition, I think this part of the value proposition proposition is actually very important for the people. So, uh, for me, for example, if I um, if I watch a YouTube influencer and uh, this influencer has a Patreon link, uh, so I might not want to uh, to see more content from this influencer, but I might see that oh, this influencer is actually uh, he's a great speaker, so. I might want to buy this token, uh, buy the token of this influencer, just to ride the trend because I believe that this influencer will have many more followers in future. Right now, let's say he or she has only a few followers, but then in future he or she will rise and uh, he or she or she will have a lot of uh, a lot of more new, new new followers, and those followers will be buying his or her token. So I might want to buy this token right now. So uh, the, if uh, the influencer has a token compared to only having Patreon or only allowing YouTube payments, 
this this uh, gives a, a new perspective, this gives a breadth, this gives um, a new value proposition. I think this value proposition is going to be very powerful. So the amount of money that the influencer can uh, attract if he or she issues a token, I think is is magnitudes more than uh, if he or she simply has a Patreon link. Also, there is a novelty effect. So right now, as I mentioned, this narrative is just at the beginning. So you cannot see uh, that influencers are issuing their own tokens. You cannot see the brands issuing their own tokens. It's just the football clubs right now. Just a just an initial wave, just an initial batch of the brands that decided to do this. Uh, but this is already a validation. This validates the narrative. This shows that uh, yes, there are pretty well known brands that are ready to do this. And so I think that in future, uh, most of other brands they will follow this. And uh, I also think that this gets spread to uh, the individual influences, the people on YouTube, Twitter, uh, who post about. Um, the different currencies or just uh, general news about crypto markets and uh, markets in general, they might want to issue their own tokens as well. Similar to how the football clubs issued their own tokens, the influencers might want to issue their own tokens. And um, uh, actually, uh, uh, my project, Fairpool, uh, I'm the CEO of Fairpool, we are working in this direction as well. We're trying to simplify this uh, issuing of the tokens uh, for the for the influences. So uh, yeah, one sec, there was another question. Let me answer your question. Um, well, uh, the the answers are, uh, I'm, I'm just speaking about, uh, I'm just answering those uh, questions live. So I hope that, oh, that was an answer. That was a question about the form, okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, so let's continue with the narrative analysis. So I've mentioned that uh, I'm working on a product that uh, allows people to issue their own tokens. So we hope that uh, by simplifying this process, we can um, strengthen this narrative. We hope that we can uh, increase the uh, amount of the uh, personal tokens. We hope that we can increase the amount of brand tokens on the market. And uh, let's see, uh, we hope that uh, just by the increase of those tokens that get, could become a snowball, where that we could have a snowball effect of uh, new brands creating new social tokens, creating new brand tokens, and the other brands seeing that, oh, uh, that brand created their brand token, and then they, they are seeing uh, the uh, more engagement from their fans, so we should create a brand token as well. So we hope that there's going to be a snowball effect in this. Um, the uh, but the problem there is a problem with the the uh, with the current social tokens as they currently are being issued. Uh, I think the fundamental problem is uh, that the uh, the brand which issues the tokens the brand has the full supply of the token. So the problem with this is that the brand can just dump the token. And go away. Uh, of course, that's not going to happen with the uh, well-known brands because they care about the reputation. Uh, but if you move down uh, the follower count, if you move to the influencers, let's say, uh, that's pretty much possible that the influencer creates a token, uh, holds 100% of the supply, dumps it, and just goes away and creates a new channel. You know, uh, it's very much possible. So at Fairpool, we want to avoid that. We want to prevent that. We want to uh, defend against that, and we want to um, protect the investors. We want to protect the people who buy such tokens. Uh, we think this is uh, an important problem, and we solve it by uh, changing the issuance mechanism of the token. So instead of uh, simply uh, um, allowing people to create the tokens, which is already possible, you can create a token right now. Uh, instead of that, that we allow people to call fair pools, the fair pool tokens. And these tokens are on one hand, these tokens have the interface of a regular ERC weighted token. So you can transfer them, you can uh, put them in the liquidity pools, you can you can list them on centralized exchanges. Hell, you can list them on Binance even. <laughs> so I hope that uh, at some day that's gonna happen, but uh, of course, no guarantee about this. It's just my hope that we're gonna be awakened over this. 
but let's see. Uh, another thing is that um, uh, the fear pools, those fear pool tokens are designed differently uh, in the sense that the uh, supply at the beginning is zero. So the influencer or the brand which creates their own token, which creates their fan token through the fair pool, doesn't have any supply initially. The initial price is zero and the initial, initial supply is zero as well. So we hope that this is more fair for the investors, more fair for the followers, because uh, if it starts at zero, then anybody can buy and the, the sooner you buy the, the better, but there is no, no private sale, no pre-sale, no seed rounds, you know? So um, in general, our, our goal is to make the issuance of those fan tokens as fair for the, fan, for the fans as possible. Uh, you might have a question like, uh, well, if the initial supply is zero, what, uh, how does the price change? What's the mechanism that governs the price? And this mechanism is actually um, uh, a fairly well-known mechanism in crypto. It's a bonding curve. So bonding curve works like this. Uh, there is a special coefficient uh, by the way of which the price increases uh, when people buy the uh, token. So uh, there is a quad quadratic curve. There's a, an exponential curve. And uh, if a person decides to buy, uh, let's say the person is, decides to invest 10 Ethereum in a specific brand token. So we calculate the amount of tokens that the person has to receive uh, based on the quadratic curve. And uh, uh, then we increase the price dynamically. And if, let's say, a second person after this first one, the, the second person decides to invest the same 10 Ethereum, so uh, the total liquidity is going to be 20 Ethereum. In this case, the second person, even though he invests or she invests uh, 10 Ethereum, the same amount, uh, but because the price has already gone up due to the purchase of the first person, this second person will get less tokens. So uh, if someone buys for a specific amount and then someone else buys for the same amount, the second person will get less tokens. Uh, and that's how we uh, manage the, uh, the price increases. Essentially, the price increases from the purchase of the first person. Uh, it's possible to sell it back. It's possible to sell back the tokens into the fair pool. And uh, the fair pool always holds the liquidity. It never allows the influence, it never allows the brand to withdraw the liquidity. So it's not possible to pull the rug. And this is what differentiates the uh, fair pool from other social uh, tokens. Uh, it's not possible to dump. It's not possible to pull the rug. Uh, we feel that these are the, the most important problems and these are the problems that we are solving by design, by the technical design of Fairpool. We're solving them uh, through the contract design on, on the technical level. So instead of relying on the reputation, uh, we're just saying, hey guys, there's a cryptographic proof that you cannot do this. And uh, by the cryptographic proof, we mean that the uh, contract is deployed on the blockchain and the source code of the contract is available. So uh, this is the only way that it can function. Anybody can verify this. Uh, if you don't know how to read code, that's okay. There are other people who know how to read, uh, other people who can who know how to read code and they can verify it. Also, we'll have audits. So, um, well, essentially, either you can verify it by yourself or you can rely on the opinion of lots of other people uh, who can verify this uh, using their own skills. And uh, we hope that this design uh, becomes um, the, the, the much more widespread design of the social tokens. Uh, and we can use this design of the social tokens specifically. This design has not been possible for the regular tokens because um, I'll give you an illustration. Let's say, uh, there's a new project in crypto, and let's say it's not a social token. Let's say it's a project uh, which makes a product, it's a startup, and they need to raise money initially. If they need to raise money, they, they have to sell their token. They have to hold their token, right? So they have to go through the old model. Uh, but there is always a risk of a rock pool. There is always a risk of um, the, uh, the dump uh, from, from the project. Uh, compared to the social tokens. So the social token, if the influencer or a brand create their own token, they don't need to sell it right away. So what they can do, they can use the fair pool design to make it more fair for their followers. 
uh, and they can also make money on the trading volume from the royalties. It's a concept which is borrowed from the NFTs. So that's uh, exactly how the brands and that's exactly how the influencers uh, would be able to uh, make money on those pair pools. So not by selling the tokens, but by promoting the tokens, by continuing to promote the tokens on their social media channels and by making money from the buy and sell volume, which is going to happen from the fans. So the fans are going to buy and sell the tokens uh, and also the traders, the speculators, the long-term investors, uh, they will buy and sell the tokens as well. And uh, we shall charge uh, a certain amount, which is going to be actually a parameter in the smart contract. So the influencer can determine their level of royalties, like how many, how many they, how much they charge from the uh, from the traders. And uh, that's how they're going to make money, not by selling the tokens, not by dumping in the followers in an unfair way. Uh, but from the trading volume, and in this case, the uh, incentives of the uh, influencer or of the brand and of their fans are aligned. Because if you, let's say, if, if you're an investor, if you want, you want to buy a token of an um, influencer, and uh, uh, you want this influencer to continue promoting this token. And if the influencer does that, then you uh, assume that the price is going to go even further up. So uh, you do want to uh, have an incentive for the influencer to continue promoting this token. And that's exactly what's, what's going to happen uh, in case of the pair pool. So if the influencer is making money on the trading volume, then the only way that the influencer can make more money is by continuing to promote the token. And this way, your incentives, the invest incentives, and the influencer incentives are aligned. And this is all. Uh, guaranteed by the smart contract. There is another question. Uh, do tokens issued through the Fairpool protocol get their own branding or name? And if not, how would one differentiate AC Milan token from a Starbucks token? Yeah, uh, you can set a name and you can set a symbol for your own token. So it's going to be possible to differentiate. And also, there's another thing. Uh, we shall require the uh, social media verification. So uh, if there is an influencer or there is a well-known brand and this brand has, let's say, 400K followers on Twitter, for example, uh, or it's a well-known influencer with the same amount of followers, uh, and they create their own token, uh, we do want to protect from scams. We do want to prevent people from, protect people from buying uh, a token which is not actually linked to this influenza. So what we're going to do, we're going to require uh, people to um, place a link uh, to either post this link to their token on our website, on the social media, or uh, which is even better, we'll ask them to place this link in the profile, in the bio section, in the website section. So let's say there's an influenza. This influenza doesn't have a personal website. Uh, influenza will be able to place a link to uh, the fair pool token to uh, in in their social media profile and that's going to be a permanent link so right now most influencers place the referral links to the exchanges uh but they can make much more money from the fair pool because it's going to be royalties on exchange you're making uh 0.10 percent maybe uh from the trading volume with fair pool you'll be able to set let's say seven percent royalties you can if you compare seven percent with 0.10 that's like 70x increases so the the influencers uh they will be uh, they, they will be very excited about this and we hope uh that they will actually be placing the fairful links in their profiles because uh that's gonna make them so much more money than the referral links than they are currently placing so we hope that the influencers will just do their math and go with the flow uh, even if they don't, we'll still require the social media verification in the sense of posting about this token. So uh, the influencers will be required to post on Twitter or make a video and place a link in the video. So uh, that's the only way for us to determine. That's the only way for us to link uh, the genuine token. Uh, that's the only way for us to distinguish between the genuine tokens and the scam tokens. And of course, we shall display this, uh, the link to, to the verifying posts in the uh, interface. So on the Fairpool website, uh, we'll show that, uh, okay, this token has been verified and here's the list of posts 
that are verifying this token. So yeah, no scams here. <laughs> but of course, you should pay attention. Of course, you should pay attention to those verification links. Uh, because we're DEX, uh, it's decentralized. Anybody can issue the token. So yeah, pay attention. Um, OK, so uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to send them to the chat. Uh, we'll wait a little bit for the questions. If not, we're going to wrap it up. OK, there's another question. Uh, do the issues get their 7% from the exchange trade volumes or all exchange volumes, such as the whole the exchange in the token on, for entry into a private event? Uh, that's going to happen only uh, on the uh, sales uh, into the fair pool contract itself. So I'm going to get a bit more technical here. Um, the fair pool contract is a single contract which uh, has both the methods of the ERC-20 contract, so it's possible to transfer those tokens. But in addition to that, it also has the buy and sell methods. And when the person calls the buy method through the interface through the Fairpool website, that's how the people buy the tokens initially. Because there is zero supply initially, but the only way to buy the token is through the Fairpool smart contract. After that, people could sell either through Fairpool smart contract or they could uh, say so go to, uh, we actually have plans for uh, developing a plugin for Discord, uh, uh, which would allow to, uh, which would allow influencers to sell their premium content uh, for their own tokens, basically making their tokens their own private currency. So uh, if the person decides to spend the tokens on the private content, then uh, those tokens are burnt and those tokens are not sold through the contract. So uh, because there is no sale, uh, the uh, royalties are not charged, of course. Uh, also, if this token is listed on a centralized exchange, let's say it's listed on KuCoin, Binance, any any other exchange, uh, then uh, the, the these trades, uh, they are not going to be covered. So the influencer, of course, will not get royalties uh, from those exchanges. Maybe they do if they have a separate agreement, but that's not going to be covered by Fairpool. Uh, what Fairpool guarantees is that uh, if someone sells into the fair pool smart contract, then there's going to be royalties. Um, but of course, if the price on an exchange goes, uh, let's say it goes up, but on the, the price in the fair pool smart contract still stays the same, then there's going to be an arbitrage opportunity. So uh, we assume that uh, just like uh, between Uniswap and Binance, for example, there is an arbitrage opportunity. And we assume that the same bots, which currently close those arbitrage opportunities in Uniswap, the same bots will be closing the arbitrage opportunities on Fairpool also. So they, they will be having uh, their funds on the, uh, on the exchange and they will be having the funds on the blockchain. And uh, they will, let's say if the price on the exchange goes up, they will buy from the Fairpool smart contract and send the token to the exchange and sell on the exchange. There, why uh, there would be uh, the, the, the prices if the prices initial are like this, the prices will get closer to each other. So, we hope that that's going to happen. Uh, so just to answer the question again, the royalties are going to be charged only on uh, fair pool trades, only on the trades within the fair pool smart contract. Uh, what blockchain is this fair pool support? Well, uh, we support all the EVM compatible smart chains. So it's going to be possible to deploy a contract on Ethereum, on Binance Smart Chain, Avalanche, uh, L2s also, uh, second layer blockchain. So you know, Arbitrum, uh, Optimism, yeah, definitely. So uh, it's going to be a very wide selection of the blockchains. Uh, we assume that most people, most uh, influencers are going to, de are going to deploy uh, either on uh, l Twos, uh, second layer blockchains because they have uh, very small fees. Uh, and um, also the well-known brands, I think they will deploy on Ethereum. Uh, and maybe because it's also possible to bridge the tokens to uh, a second layer blockchain, uh, they will be bridging them to, uh, they will be deploying on Ethereum and bridging them to a second layer blockchain to facilitate the trade here. Uh, we do have the plans to uh, allow native bridging uh, and by native bridging, I mean creating a smart contracts on another blockchain, which also charge the royalties. So instead of bridging and uh, creating a new liquidity pool, uh, which requires money, by the way, which requires locking the funds, 
uh, we shall allow to bridge the tokens and continue trading on another blockchain without actually uh, providing liquidity, without uh, without putting any money in. And by the way, that's another advantage of fair pool because the initial liquidity is zero. Uh, you don't need to provide initial liquidity. You don't need to lock the money. And uh, that's great for smaller influences uh, and great for the brands also uh, who don't hold a lot of cryptocurrency right now. For example, there, there's a company which uh, by their mandate, they cannot hold cryptocurrency. So they can issue a fair pool token because it doesn't require them to hold crypto. They don't need to provide liquidity into their liquidity pool. The uh, All the trading is handled by fair pool and fair pool handles all the liquidity, ho holds the liquidity for trading. Uh, I hope that answers the questions. Um, actually, we are already uh, reaching the uh, limit of our uh, our workshop. So if you have any more questions, feel free to send them right now. We're going to wait one minute and then we're going to be wrapping up. Okay. Uh, so now, no more questions yet. Uh, it's going to wait a little bit more. Um, you should check the websites. Uh, check the website of Metrics DAO. I know that lots of people already know about Metrics DAO here, but uh, I think it's a great project. I think uh, they are moving crypto forward. And thank you, by the way. Thank you for organizing this work workshop. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, there's uh, another website. is the Fairpool website. Right now, we are in uh, development, so we haven't even released the beta yet. We just recently started. So um, you might want to take a look. And if you want to create your own token, uh, you can join the waste right now. Uh, that's the wait list for people who want to create their tokens. Uh, if you want to trade uh, the tokens, you uh, could join us, uh, could follow us on the social media. Uh, right now, we are going by the handle of Call Liquidity. So we haven't rebranded yet from Call Liquidity, which was our previous project, to Fairpool. Um, but yeah, uh, we, we already have the social media presence. Call Liquidity, you can find us. Uh, or you can just go to the website and then you can find us here. Uh, so I see, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for for this, uh, for the links to the social media. Uh, I guess no more questions, so we can wrap it up. I'll pass it back to you, uh, representative from Metrics DAO. Great. Thank okay. you, Dennis. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, I learned a lot about social tokens and the current landscape, so it was very, very good for me. Um, so before we go, let's just let's just go through some of the events that we have coming up in the next week. As usual, next Tuesday at noon, we'll have our community call. And then on the same day at 4 p.m. Eastern, we will have the final session of the Web Analytics 101 course. This is a very star-studded career panel with well-known names from Dune. We will have Aga Day, we'll have Andrew Hong, we'll have Hill Dobby all joining us for that final session. And as a, spe a special event to close out the week on Thursday, December 22nd at 12 p.m. Eastern, we'll have a final community call of the year in which we look forward to all the exciting new developments coming in 2023. Now, the, not the least of which is our new application and our um, protocol back in the application. So please join us in those events. Now, uh, before we leave, Dennis, any final thoughts? Well, uh, I would like to thank you for inviting me to uh, this workshop, for orga organizing the workshop. And uh, for the final, um, let's say, uh, pay attention to, I'll just summarize it. Pay attention to the spread of the idea. Don't, there's, there's no need to determine whether this idea is right or wrong. Uh, just go with the flow, basically. Go with the flow. Okay, with that, we're closing the event. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Dennis. I'll see Thank you, you guys. Thank you very much for event. having me. Okay, bye-bye. See ya.